joined today by Laura Boyce, Executive Director of Teach Plus PA. Governor Josh Shapiro signed the state budget earlier this month. What were Teach Plus PA's priorities for this budget? The number one priority that we had for this budget was to ensure that the General Assembly addressed the Commonwealth Court's decision that our school funding system was unconstitutional and recognize the obligation of the legislature to incorporate adequacy as a goal of our school funding system and begin to close the, the large multi-billion dollar adequacy gap and ensure that we fix a system where the students who uh, need the most get the least because of where they live. That was number one priority was really those reforms to our school funding system. We were also very interested in ensuring that uh, our teacher pipeline begins to be rebuilt uh, by fully funding the student teacher stipend program that was enacted last year. And another major priority for us was um, passing reforms to our uh, approach to teaching reading through uh, science of reading legislation in the form of Senate Bill 801. Do you feel like these priorities were met? It's a mixed bag. Uh, we saw progress on many. Uh, we didn't see everything that we were asking for, which is, you know, as the governor says, something that we expect sometimes with a divided legislature. Um, the, the good news in terms of school funding was that the legislature did, for the first time, uh, acknowledge its responsibility to adequately fund our schools, and they incorporated into the, the school code legislation a methodology for calculating the state share of the amount of adequacy funding they owe to schools. And so that calculation comes to about four and a half billion dollars. And they put in a sizable down payment of almost five hundred million dollars in adequacy funding to the, those most underfunded districts. Um, so we're glad to see that the uh, legislature has come to a consensus around how to quantify the amount they owe and that they've started to um, put themselves on on a path towards closing the gap. The bad news was that the uh, legislature did not commit themselves to a timeline uh, for closing the gap. And the amount that they put forth this year was about 11 percent of that overall gap, which is you know not sufficient uh, for us to see it closed in a five to seven year timeline, which is what advocates were hoping for. So we saw progress. We are looking forward to continuing to push for that gap to be closed, um, but it didn't get all the way there. On student teacher stipends, we saw the um, legislature increase funding um, by uh, $10 million compared to last year. They invested $20 million in student teacher stipends on top of $10 million last year. So that was a 100% increase and 50% more than what Governor Shapiro had proposed. So that was a, a huge win, but still not quite enough to fully fund the program, which is estimated at about $45 million. And so again, progress, but not all the way across the finish line. And then our biggest disappointment was around the science of reading legislation, which failed to make it into the final budget agreement. And so that's uh, unfinished business that we'll be continuing to work on in the next legislative cycle and uh, budget season. Can you explain what the science of reading legislation is that you keep mentioning? Sure. Um, so there is a pretty vast body of research on how our brains learn to read. It's uh, something that's not a natural process for us as humans to learn how to read. We, as humans, learn how to speak naturally. You don't have to teach a baby how to speak because we are hardwired for uh, oral language. But our brains are not hardwired to learn to read and write. That is a, a process where we have to literally rewire our brains to connect the parts of our brain that process visual information to the parts of our brains that uh, process auditory information. And so we've learned a lot over the last few decades of neuroscience research around how we actually teach children how to read. Um, unfortunately, our teacher training has not necessarily kept up with that um, science of reading as well as our curricula. And so many teachers, myself included, when I was uh, first training as a teacher, did not learn the most evidence-based ways to teach reading. And as a result, we teach kids how to guess at uh, words using pictures and do other things that are actually counterproductive to being a proficient reader. We see the results of that when we look at uh, Pennsylvania's reading achievement, where uh, reading scores have really been um, declining in recent years. According to the nation's report card, only about one in three Pennsylvania fourth graders reads on grade level. And this is a hugely predictive outcome of future academic success and life success. Um, and so the science of reading legislation would have required all schools in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to adopt curricula aligned with the science of reading, as well as provided for teacher training, 
uh, assessment intervention aligned with the science of reading, along with funding to support schools in adopting those new uh, materials and practices. Earlier, you mentioned the court case with the Commonwealth Court declaring that Pennsylvania's system for pun funding public schools was unconstitutional. Can you explain a little bit how the public schools are currently funded in Pennsylvania? And I know you mentioned the budget is going to put some money to uh, fix the gap, but is there sure. anything else that you wish the budget had done to improve this difference in funding? Sure. So. The Commonwealth Court found that our school funding system is unconstitutional because it violates um, both our education clause in our state constitution, which guarantees a thorough and efficient system of public education, as well as our equal protection clause. Um, specifically, our, our past funding system, because the state was under investing in terms of what the state put into resources uh, for education, our system was very overly reliant on local property taxes, local wealth. And the state found that that violates our equal protection clause because it discriminates against students in low wealth districts because those low wealth districts just don't have the local wealth to be able to make up for the shortfall that the state was not putting forward. And so uh, we have argued, other advocates have argued along with the law firms uh, that brought the lawsuit that a constitutional system must take into account what is actually required for every student to succeed. The t research tells us that every student can succeed, but that certain students who are living in poverty, for example, or who are English language learners, require additional resources to succeed. And oftentimes those students are concentrated in these low wealth districts that have the least resources. That's why we say the students who need the most get the least because of where they live. And so what we were looking to see in a, you know, a constitutionally compliant system is a methodology for calculating what's actually required in each district, those are called adequacy targets, a methodology for figuring out what's the state's responsibility or share of that overall gap, and then a timeline for closing the state share of the gap over a reasonable number of years, five to seven years. And so, as I said, the, the state budget did part of that. It created a, a justifiable methodology for uh, calculating the overall adequacy gap, which comes to $4.5 billion. That was artificially decreased a little bit by a change to the methodology in calculating and measuring student poverty that we believe was a, was a political calculated um, and cynical move to just lower the price tag. So our estimates are that the, the the overall adequacy gap was more than $5 billion, but $4.5 billion is what the legislature has agreed on. The missing piece that we'll be continuing to push for is that clear timeline and plan and commitment to actually fully close the gap. The, the legislature has implicitly said, here's the overall gap, and they've started to close it, but they haven't said, this is when we will close it and exactly how much we'll be committing each year in order to close it. Last question, another topic around schools that have been in the news a lot recently is school vouchers, and they were left out of the budget this year. How does that impact public schools? That's great news for public schools because it means that we can continue to devote our public resources to closing that unconstitutional adequacy gap and ensuring that our public schools, which are the only schools required by law to serve all students, have the resources that they need. We know that uh, there's still a long way to go to actually close the full gap, and there should be no consideration of vouchers uh, at all while we still have this unconstitutional gap in our public education system, which again is part of the legislature's constitutional requirement to fund. We've been speaking with Laura Boyce, Executive, Executive Director of Teach Plus PA. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me.